Coming up on this episode, it's time for another visit to Dante's Cove as we recap episode two. Welcome to episode 363 of the Big Gay Fiction Podcast, the show for avid readers and passionate fans of gay romance fiction. I'm Will, and with me, as always, is my co-host and husband, Jeff. Hello, Rainbow Romance readers. It's great to have you back with us. As always, the podcast is brought to you in part by our remarkable community on Patreon, and we'd like to quickly thank them for their support, including our newest member, Liza, and a warrior's spirit who recently increased their pledge. It's because of our patrons that we're able to bring you podcast episodes every single week with interviews from some of your favorite authors and reviews of some of the most amazing books our genre has to offer. On the Big Gay Fiction Podcast Patreon page, members have access to Patreon first content, stuff they get to hear before anyone else, and they also have the chance to ask questions to our upcoming guests. Patrons help fund the transcription of the episodes, making sure this show is accessible to all readers and listeners. If you're in a position to help the podcast grow and would like more information, simply head on over to patreon.com slash biggayfictionpodcast. So the Winter Olympics concluded this past weekend, and over those two weeks, we did enjoy some of the competitions. As always, we watched a good bit of figure skating with the men's, the ice dancing, and some of the pairs competition. It was really thrilling to watch Nathan Chin deliver two incredible performances to win his gold medal. It was also great to watch the stories of the athletes from the LGBTQ community and the first openly non-binary athlete to compete at the Games, as American Timothy Leduc competed in pairs figure skating. Now, in addition to the skating, we also watched a good bit of snowboarding, bobsled, skeleton, luge. And yeah, we kind of like watching people go at insane speeds on various type of sleds. There's just something kind of thrilling about that. We also caught some skiing, and for me, I actually watched a good bit of hockey and curling. Now, while the Olympics might be over, you could still enjoy several winter sports through the pages of the gay romances that are a part of the Winter Olympics promotion that continues to run through the end of this month. You'll find romances involving hockey players, figure skaters, snowboarders, and curlers from authors like Kira Andrews, Letta Blake, Avery Cockburn, Lane Hayes, V.O. Losey, B.L. Maxwell, Chantel Murr, Sean Michael, N.J. Lisk, R.J. Scott, and Susan Scott Shelley. Plus, I've got a book in there, too. It's really an amazing lineup. And even better, most of these books are on sale, too, so you could stock up. You can find a list of books and where to purchase them at biggayfictionpodcast.com slash Olympics or at the link in the show notes. So before we get to our discussion of Dante's Cove, we want to quickly mention another series that we recently enjoyed, a German series on Netflix called Kitz, K-I-T-Z. Now, if you can imagine revenge mixed with pretty little liars set in the Alps, you kind of get an idea of what Kitz is all about. You could not have found some better analogies there for that. So the show gets its name from the town itself, Kitzbühel, which I'm sure I'm only sort of pronouncing correctly. It's kind of like Aspen, a snowy playground for the rich and famous. And at the center of the show is a local girl named Lissy, and she's plotting revenge against the people she holds responsible for her brother's death a year before. At the start of the series, she befriends a rich, beautiful, insta-famous group of friends, becoming an integral part of their clique before burning it all down, literally and figuratively. Helping Lissy in her plan is her best friend, local nice guy farm boy Hans, who's been having a secret fling with a spoiled hotel heir named Kosh the kind of rich boy who is damaged and oh so very messy. Messy doesn't even begin to describe (laughs) Kosh. And yet I just wanted to take care of him at the same time. (laughs) Put him back together again. And in first glance, it's really hard to see what Hans and Kosh might have in common. It seems to truly be a case of opposites attracting. But as the series unfolds, we do truly get to see that they are good for each other. There are lots of twists and turns. And by the end, everyone gets a happy ending. But there is one big final twist that throws everything into question once again. So Netflix Germany, I hope you're working on Series 2 right now. Yeah, they better be because I was all set to just ride off happily into the sunset and then whammo right there at the end. It was quite the twist. I really enjoyed this series a whole bunch. I thought the twists and the turns and the mystery and what... Lizzie was doing and what she was uncovering as she went along was really thrilling. I was often left like, oh, wow, so that. 
But then there was Hans and Kosh, too, who just every time they were on screen, whether it was in the early part of them trying to come together and the push and pull that they had with each other, or as it was later, as they were kind of deciding to maybe go for this thing, their relationship just gave me all kinds of heart eyes as it played out, because they turned out to be really good for each other. Yeah, show up for the mystery and stay for the nice squishy romance that's in there, too. <laughs> There were six episodes in the first season of Kits, making it perfectly bingeable in a single day or a weekend. We really enjoyed it and think you might as well. Kits is available to watch right now on Netflix. So that's a new series that we've been watching. Are you ready to throw it back for another classic episode of everybody's favorite supernatural soap, Dante's Cove? Oh my, yes. I was surprised, even before you get into the notes, I'll say I was surprised at how much more kooky episode two was over episode one. Now that we've got everybody introduced, the real crazy town stuff can actually begin. So let's dive into our discussion of episode two by quickly reading the wiki description of this particular episode, which just so happened to have aired originally on my birthday way back in 2005. Now, as we rewatched this last night, I actually don't remember there being an episode title card. But no. Wiki says this episode is called Then There Was Darkness, which is a play on the name of the first episode, which was called In the Beginning. And as you say that, it just makes me think of Snoopy's favorite first line on a dark and stormy night. I don't know why, other than the fact that there's a lot of thunder and lightning that goes down on Dante's Cove. That doesn't really seem to concern anyone. We can talk more about that as we get going. <laughs> Well, no, let's talk about it right now, because it's for a certain kind of viewer, this might be a sticking point vis-a-vis the realism that is not on display in this particular program. (laughs) If you're looking for that, this is not for you. (laughs) There's a particularly strange phenomenon that goes on in Dante's Cove, where indoors, Mm -hmm. there is constant thunder and lightning, but anytime any of our characters go outside... The weather is perfectly fine. Yeah, it's it's really weird. <laughs> and that really stuck with me last night too, because there was a lot of thunder and lightning moments. It's not about it's not about the weather, it's about the mood. It does set a mood. They're setting a mood. There was a lot of thunder and lightning, sound and lighting effects in use, and there was also a crap ton of candles and fire in use too. <laughs> anyway, so the description of Then There Was Darkness goes. Ambrosius quickly becomes obsessed with Kevin, using his treesome powers to seduce him. Grace, still jealous and angry over Ambrosius's betrayal, murders Kevin in the hospital. Enraged, Ambrosius attacks Grace and imprisons and ages her as she did him. Through some unknown means, Kevin is restored to life by a kiss from Ambrosius. However, Grace's act breaks the spell that Kevin had been under, leaving him without any memory of Ambrosius. Van, using a spell from a book of treason she's found, is able to reverse his curse and free Kevin to again be with Toby. Also drawn into Ambrosius's influence is Corey, who also lives at the hotel. Corey develops a Renfield-like fixation on um, Corey develops a Renfield-like fixation on Ambrosius, and after he tries and fails to break up the couple by lying about their infidelities, the season ends with Ambrosius deeply obsessed with Kevin and Corey seemingly murdering Toby and dumping his body in the ocean. To be continued. <laughs> <laughs> which it didn't even have as a title card at the end of the episode. You just had to assume it was coming back. <laughs> yeah, so before we get into the details of this particular episode, I want to talk about something that Description just mentioned. This is the season finale. Season one of Dante's Cove was only two episodes long, but those episodes were extended. Each one was roughly movie length. And that is the case with episode two. As previously mentioned, there wasn't a whole lot of story going on in episode one. Basically, a whole lot of Cinemax erotic humping was going on. Episode 2 has nearly quadrupled the plot. At least, yes. So I'm going to (laughs) describe it in as clear a way as humanly possible. Which in some cases won't be, because there were some (laughs) massive logic leaps going on at times. At times, I was sort of like, huh? But then I said, it's like, it's Dante's Cove. It doesn't have to make sense. No, it doesn't. It just has to be fun. So we open with Kevin, and he's in the hospital, which is where he ended up after episode one. And he is having what is kind of hard to tell, either a dream or he's remembering past events. I went more for fever dream. There's like a 
romantic sun dappled montage of him and Toby rolling around in the grass feeding strawberries to one another, <laughs> which is interrupted by sexy thoughts of Ambrosius, who is taking up residence in a great big lighthouse. Because that's what you do. It is one of the best lairs ever. <laughs> And because he is the one who freed Ambrosius with a kiss from his magical captivity, they have some sort of undefined connection, and he's calling out to him. Repeatedly. And Kevin is compelled to get up out of his hospital bed and sleepwalk to the great big lighthouse. Gee, I wonder what that symbolizes. And Kevin descends the circular staircase into his candlelit boudoir. Yeah. Losing his hospital gown and underwear on the way, which, in a very tidy fashion, he picks back up and puts on as he leaves later. And in the morning when Van visits Kevin, he seems none the worse for wear for his nocturnal adventure. <laughs> but trouble is on the horizon. Grace, the witch who is wronged by Ambrosius, and who we haven't seen since the prologue of episode one, returns to the cove in a sexy nurse outfit. She had the shortest of short skirt of any of any nurse in that hospital. And yet cute library in glasses. It's very it's very odd. So in a move to torture Ambrosius and drive him back into her arms, she uses her red eye witchy magic to kill Kevin. Now here's something I found interesting about this. Well, we've seen the red eye witchy magic before, and we've seen it at least twice in the first episode. These people steam up and eventually melt into either goo or nothingness. She managed to just cook Kevin enough to kill him, but not make him disappear. Now, I don't know if that was like deliberate on her part to, you know, leave a corpse to not ask too many questions, or if in fact we needed to have that as a plot point, because of course, if you made Kevin go away, it'd be much harder to resurrect him later. Trees and powers, who can say? So Van and Toby bring Kevin some get well balloons, but when they arrive at the hospital, they say, I'm so sorry, Kevin has dropped dead. <laughs> Which gives both of them a real opportunity to act. But you know, to that, to the, as you say that, I, I do want to point out too that in the vastness of Dante's Cove overacting, of which there is, you know, Charlie David, who plays Toby, and Nadine Nicole, who plays Van, actually overact far less than everybody else lending it a little bit of groundedness over the grieving of now presumably dead kevin at least how i looked at it because boy is there overacting going on in this episode in particular that we'll talk more about soon i didn't mean they were acting in a bad way it's just that there's some serious ugly cry faces going on oh yeah Oh, yeah, for sure. They they mastered the ugly cry face. So Ambrosius calls out to Kevin once again, but when he doesn't answer, he's not picking up the phone. <laughs> um, he goes to the hospital and then to the morgue to see his beloved laid out underneath the sheet. And it's there that he has a confrontation with Grace. And I'm not going to say this is necessarily a dynasty level cat fight. It's close. But there is some prime bitchy dialogue and they use their magic to, like, lay into one another. If you want to talk about some overacting going on, this is the first time that we've really seen Tracy Scoggins and William Gregory Lee really go at it with each other. Because as she was, like, damning him to his 200 years or whatever, he was pissed, but he was also kind of stuck. And now that he's got his powers, this is the first of many scenes where these two go at it. And I have to think... Or at least I hope. I hope the actors enjoyed these scenes because they looked a lot of fun as they're just chewing up the scenery and each other in their confrontation scenes in this episode. So Grace gains the upper hand first, which leads to her having a flashback to the old timey days. As you do when you have the upper hand. <laughs> when Ambrosius was courting her and her mother wasn't very approving of the match. And it's here that we slowly start to fill in some of the backstory and information about Treesome and how it works and how Grace is going to ascend to be the Treesome High Priestess and yada, yada, yada. And it's while Grace is taking this walk down memory lane that Ambrosius gets the upper hand. You need to pay attention when yeah. you're in a fight. <laughs> <laughs> and he imprisons her in the dungeon in the basement of the Hotel Dante. That night while Toby is laying in bed, the ghost kids tell him that something is up. 
So Toby goes to the hospital, and indeed, Kevin is up and walking around. Ta-da! Presumably, a kiss that Ambrosius has given him has somehow awakened him from whatever voodoo shenanigans Grace was up to. I tell you, it's not 100% clear if Ambrosius did that, or Grace did that, or who did that. But hey, Kevin's up and around again. So now that he's alive and well... I don't know if he's quite well, but at least alive. (laughs) Quite yet. Toby is the third wheel in Ambrosius's grand romantic plan, so he takes a hatchet and is about to do away with Toby in his bed, giving off some very Joan Crawford in Straight Jacket vibes. <laughs> uh, an amazing movie, by the way. But the ghost twins stop him from doing so. He briefly feels bad or something. Something. It's not a hundred percent. Well, it's not completely clear. Of all the scenes in Dante's that are not logically organized and shot this one really struck me because so toby's in probably a queen size bed and he's laying on the far side away from ambrosius ambrosius is going to have to lean over the empty part of the bed to be able to strike toby at all why would you not just stand over him to hack him. Now I'm assuming they had to do this maybe because they're in a practical room and not a soundstage so they could flip the camera angle easily. He looked ridiculous to me. Like, how are you going to actually do this well from over there? And two, why aren't you just using your powers? And the ghost kids, I don't know if we mentioned, did we mention in the last time we talked about this, that the, the ghost kid is boo boo Stewart. Yes. We briefly touched on them. But only in passing because narratively they don't have much more to do. Yeah, they weren't doing much in that episode. And they won't ever again. They're essentially forgotten after this Which episode. Which is weird because they put out this whole thing about something that happened to them in the 1950s that is not resolved in this episode and may never be resolved as the series goes on. <laughs> well, as I mentioned before, there was a lot of setup. And a lot of different characters in episode one that we never hear from again. And that is the case here. There were several residents of the Hotel Dante that we saw humping away in episode one and are now completely forgotten about. Yeah, even by episode two, there's a few (laughs) that are already like, who? So after that failed murder attempt, Bro runs into Corey in the courtyard of the Hotel Dante. And this, incidentally, is the first instance of someone giving Ambrosius his nickname. Corey calls him brocious, which is equal parts stupid and adorable. Later on in the series, it will simply be shortened to bro. But Ambrosius sees possibilities in the lovable hotel slut, so he takes Corey back to his lighthouse lair. And when Corey realizes this isn't quite the hookup he imagined, he tries to make a run for it, but is unable to escape Brocious's sexy clutches. Well, he was whammied by some treason, so... <laughs> yeah, definitely. So it's in Ambrosius's subterranean lighthouse sex dungeon that they undertake this blood ritual, making Kari his faithful sex servant. Strangest blood ritual ever. Ambrosius cuts open his stomach and makes him drink the blood. I mean, of all the things you could do, you know, it wasn't just the simple, I'm going to bite my arm or slice my arm and you're going to drink from there. You have to drink from my tummy. It's like, what? It's not a tummy. Those are sexy freaking abs. Sure. Okay. And that becoming his sex slave also comes with an entirely new outfit for Corey, which should be the first clue to everybody that something is not right. I know. (laughs) Poor Corey. Ambrosius made him put on pants. Not just pants, leather pants. Or at least they look like leather pants, which probably means they're faux leather pants, which is even worse. Well, okay, speaking of leather ensembles, we need to talk about Ambrosius for a second. He spends the entire episode strutting around like gothic Elvis with his jet black hair and his black leather ensemble. Can you imagine how unfortunate that was in Turks and Caicos in the summer when they're clearly already warm anyway? But to spend every scene either naked or in that? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a look, but not entirely practical. Yeah. And then poor Corey, you know, goes right for the leather wear, which, like I said, (laughs) over and above his gaunt, distressed appearance after the changeover, the fact that he went from, like, short shorts and an open shirt to leather pants and 
that sleeveless tight leather shirt thing it's like can't you see he's tweaked this is not what he wears so sex zombie cory is definitely under some sort of renfield like spell and he pays a visit to kevin in the hospital and he's trying to sow seeds of doubt and he tells kevin that toby is a dog-faced dog type cheater and kevin being young and impressionable sort of falls for it and then cory pays a visit to toby at the bar where he works And he does the same thing. And Toby, being slightly older and a little bit wiser, isn't falling for any of it. Well, when you consider the things that got told, the lie that he told Kevin was much more plausible than the lie that he told Toby. The whole thing that Kevin actually came on and slept with with Corey was like, you couldn't come up with something maybe a little bit better for that? And yeah, Toby is a slightly older and wiser, but Kevin, to his credit, also was like, I don't know that I believe you. And I gave him the benefit of the doubt for being a little more fuzzy because he was just dead not that long ago. So his you know faculties aren't quite back to normal yet. Revisiting this episode, I find I have a real soft spot for the Corey character, especially in these two particular scenes. He's trying so damn hard, but he's really bad at this. <laughs> It's kind of adorable and hilarious at the same time. It is. And it's not the actor, I don't think, being bad. He's actually, you know, trying to carry out Ambrosius's demands, but not being the best liar. Because deep down, he's just this happy-go-lucky guy who is just out to have some sex and a nice time. And he's being tasked with some very serious stuff here, trying to keep Ambrosius happy. So at the local historical society, Van and Toby learn a little bit more about Grace's backstory. And they also happen to find a copy of the Book of Treesum just laying around. How many of these are there? Because Ambrosius has one too. (laughs) All of his own. So I don't know where he got his, but here's another one. Yet so far in the series, we have two Books of Treesum. The one that Ambrosius has, which Grace kept in the dungeon underneath the Hotel Dante. And I'm not 100% sure where this second book has come from. And as a book, it seems to serve several different narrative purposes. (laughs) It seems to be both a book of spells as well as sort of a history. Which you're all in one guide. (laughs) (laughs) Treesome 101. (laughs) Treesome for dummies is essentially what it is. Well, I will talk more about that in a second. (laughs) (laughs) So after Kevin's whole back from the dead thing, Van is convinced that she can use the book to cast a spell to break whatever curse has been placed on him. So the two of them arrive at Kevin's bedside. Van uses the book to abracadabra him. Kevin and Toby make up, and the three of them decide to celebrate with a bonfire party on the beach. I'd call that more of a campfire. That was not a really big fire. (laughs) Bonfire is being really generous. Potato, (laughs) potato. Let's talk about Van for a minute. So we've learned so far that Grace is supposed to be this priestess. We know from the flashbacks at the time that she was looking to marry Ambrosius that she had not fully come into her powers yet. She wasn't fully versed yet in the ways of treason and didn't quite understand what she was doing, blah, blah, blah. We know that somehow Ambrosius learned treason during his 200 years or whatever of captivity below the Hotel Dante. Van spends 10 minutes with this book, flips to the right page, and unwhammies Kevin. Really? <laughs> Is treason hard to learn or not? <laughs> there wasn't even that moment. I mean, they did look through the book a little bit, but they were mostly in the historical part of the book, trying to sort out what this was and stuff. There wasn't even that moment with the grimoire of going over and going, might be this spell, might be this spell. Hermione spends more time with spell books and Harry Potter than than Van did in this entire moment to unwhammy Kevin. And nobody blinks an eye at it, for that matter. (laughs) Even Ambrosius and Grace both have this moment of, something just happened. You could tell that they registered this disturbance in the force, but they don't really say anything about it. They just have this one facial expression over it. I am of the opinion that you might be overthinking this just a little bit. And I'm willing to accept that, but you know. Now, if memory serves, in season two, Van explores her interest in Treesum a little bit more. She and does. she and she tries to get Grace to kind of take her under her wing and Grace sort of sees possibilities in her. So she may have some innate capabilities. Sure. But even for Van, she wasn't like, hey, I just did that. It was like, okay, that worked. Yay. <laughs> 
Anyway, <laughs> our happy trio are on the beach at night. And as the episode draws to a close, Corey and Ambrosius lure Toby away and conk him on the head and toss him off of the end of the pier. Yet another moment where it's like, Ambrosius, you've got some powers. Why not use that instead of using an axe or this random rock that you found somewhere? (laughs) Which means Kevin is now in Ambrosius's clutches and Grace has managed to muster enough power to break free from her captivity leaving the door open for more supernatural shenanigans in Season 2 of Dante's Cove. I look forward to it. As I remember in Season 2, they refined themselves a little bit more. I assume they learned a lot of stuff from Season 1, figured out what they wanted to do a little more, but I look forward to continuing the shenanigans next month. Yeah, all kidding aside, I love this show so hard. Oh, I did too. It was so fun to watch all this crazy town stuff going on. It's, it's so, it's just so damn wonderful. Any final thoughts before we wrap up this? Well, you know, we didn't talk about Stephen Amell much this time. We talked about him a little bit in the first episode, and he did have a few more things to do here because theoretically Adam and Toby have been best friends since, you know, fifth grade or whatever. And he had some making up to do with Toby because he, 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 you know, got into him so hard about. He's he's shitting on his and Kevin's relationship and being kind of pissy about the whole thing. Yeah, there was some decent moments between him and Toby in this episode trying to make up for it. And then Adam being all sorry that, you know, Kevin died for five minutes. And I mentioned in episode one, I thought Stephen Amell was particularly awful in this role. Mm -hmm. And that does not change in episode two. It proved it even more because Uh, he had he had more to do (laughs) besides, you know, stand around and be pretty. And this is the episode, though, where you see his butt. The butt thing is in full display in this episode. As awful as he is as an actor in this particular series, you really can't deny he is spectacularly beautiful. A youthful, freshly scrubbed pretty boy in the early 2000s Abercrombie and Fitch kind of way. Mm -hmm. And it's really impressive, too, when you look at him as an actor and even how he's taken care of himself over the years. By the time he got to Arrow... His acting had improved about a billion fold, and he kept his looks and improved on them with age as well. It's a very interesting look at a very early role for an actor who became a pop culture icon there for a while with Arrow. So yeah, next month we move into season two, and the Hotel Dante picks up and moves and becomes an entirely different building that we'll talk about why that happened when we get into it next month. Yep, so definitely looking forward to talking about that. If you'd like to check out Dante's Cove for the first time, or maybe revisit it, the episodes can be found streaming on Amazon Prime Video. And as we mentioned earlier, this episode's transcript has been brought to you by our community on Patreon. If you'd like to read our conversation for yourself, simply head on over to the show notes page for this episode at BigGayFictionPodcast.com. And if you've watched Dante's Cove in the past, or are maybe checking it out now because we're talking about it, we'd love to know what you think of the show. Let us know by leaving a comment on that very same show notes page. All right. I think that'll do it for now. Coming up next in episode 364, we've got reviews of what we've been reading recently and a preview of some of the books that we're looking forward to in March. I have finally read some Tao Bauer and oh boy, did I love that. You'll hear all about that from me next week. On behalf of Jeff and myself, we want to thank you so much for listening, and we hope that you'll join us again soon for more discussions of the kind of stories that we all love, the big gay fiction kind. Until then, keep turning those pages and keep reading. Big Gay Fiction Podcast is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Find more shows you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. Production assistance by Tyson Greenan. Original theme music by Daryl Banner. 